Okay, so hi everyone. Today's topic is going to be on periodic paralysis. So today's discussion will be restricting it to hypokalemic as well as hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. But uh, before we go into the topic, I thought I'll just list out the important channelopathies that you need to know. Okay, so what are the important channelopathies? Actually, there are a lot of channelopathies, but I'll just mention the important ones over here. So those that are going to involve the calcium channel is going to be hypokalemic periodic paralysis. Those that are going to involve the sodium channel is going to be hyperkalemic periodic paralysis as well as paramyotonia congenita. Those that are going to involve the potassium channel is going to be anderson tavel syndrome. It's going to be anderson tavel syndrome. And those that are going to involve the chloride channel is going to be myotonia, myotonia congenita. So in myotonia congenita, uh, we have uh, Thomson disease as well as Becker's disease. Uh, remember that all of these are going to be autosomal dominant. All of these are autosomal dominant with the exception of Becker's disease. Okay, with the exception of Becker's disease, which is actually a type of myotonia congenita that is inherited autosomal recessively. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about hypokalemic as well as hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. So I've uploaded the notes for this class as well as the other channelopathies on Neuraxis Pro. So I've put the link in the description. Those who want to access my content can do so over there. And I've also put the link to my Telegram group for those who are interested in discussing regular MCQs for uh, NEAT SSDM Neurology. Okay, so let's get into the class. So first coming to hypokalemic periodic paralysis. So as we discussed earlier, the inheritance is going to be autosomal dominant and the onset is usually in the second decade. So remember that any hypokalemic paralysis that is going to happen after 25, of, after 25 years of age is very unlikely to be hypokalemic periodic paralysis. An exception to this rule is pyrotoxic periodic paralysis which can occur at any period of time. But remember, primary hypokalemic periodic paralysis usually occurs within the second decade and it's very unlikely to happen after 25 years of age. And the age and uh, males are more likely to be affected. So males are much more likely to be affected than females because of reduced penetrance in female patients. So, as we discussed earlier, hypokalemic periodic paralysis is a calcium channelopathy. So, 90% of the times, it's going to be a calcium channel mutation. But rarely, remember that rarely, in 10% of the times, it can also be because of sodium channel mutations. So, the most common type that is because of calcium channel mutation is type 1 hypokalemic periodic paralysis. And the rarer one that is because of sodium channel mutation is known as type 2 hypokalemic periodic paralysis. But for the exam purpose, for MCQs, always remember, Hypokalemic periodic paralysis is a calcium channelopathy, whereas hyperkalemic periodic paralysis is a sodium channelopathy. Okay, so other than genetic testing, how can you clinically doubt a patient is having type 2 hypokalemic periodic paralysis? So a few points to that is, patients are going to have myalgias following attacks. Patients are going to have myalgias following attacks and the age of onset is going to be a little older over here and the duration of attacks are going to be shorter. Okay, and remember the important drug that we actually use for type 1 hypokalemic periodic paralysis can actually worsen symptoms or trigger attacks in type 2 hypokalemic periodic paralysis. So remember, do not give acetazolamide for type 2 hypokalemic periodic paralysis. And for theory, just remember in muscle biopsy, you're going to have predominantly tubular aggregates instead of vacuoles in type 2 hypokalemic periodic paralysis. So what are the triggering factors? So the classical history is going to be a young male patient who's going to have a very high carb and high sodium diet in the night before, probably something like a pizza or a pasta, is going to go to sleep and going to wake up in the morning with a flaccid quadriparesis. So the important triggering factors are going to be a high carb diet, high sodium diet, and a period of rest following prolonged exercise. So remember that the attacks are usually going to occur in the early morning. So what are the clinical features? So you're going to have a flaccid paralysis, which is going to be predominantly proximal, obviously, because the muscles are going to be involved over here. And remember, the attack can last up to 24 hours. But of course, remember, the attacks can be a little briefer if the patient is going to have type 2. Okay, the patient is going to have type 2 hypokalemic paralysis. The, uh, the attack can be a little briefer. And even though the patient is going to have quadriparesis or uh, uh, quadriplegia, remember that the respiratory, bulbar and ocular muscles are going to be spared in these patients. So respiratory paralysis is pretty rare over here. But however, the patient can develop cardiac arrhythmias because of hypokalemia and even though the patient is going to recover uh, after a period of time the patient is going to develop inter-attack weakness that is irrespective of the attacks between the attacks the patient is going to develop a 
progressive myopathy okay and this progressive myopathy is usually going to involve the lower limbs okay so coming to thyrotoxic periodic paralysis so how do you differentiate thyrotoxic periodic paralysis from hypokalemic periodic paralysis so number 1 it's not familial okay so always remember periodic paralysis that is hypokalemic periodic paralysis usually has a strong family history whereas thyrotoxic periodic paralysis is usually not familial it's very common in pa uh, in patients who are of asian descent and the serum potassium over here is going to be much lower usually lower than 2.5 so the serum potassium levels are going to be much lower than primary hypokalemic periodic paralysis number 4 even though thyrotoxicosis and other thyroid disorders are more common in female patients remember that thyrotoxic periodic paralysis is more common in males it's more common in males and very rarely it can be because of a potassium channel mutation rarely it can be because of a potassium channel mutation and number 6 remember the treatment is always treating the underlying thyroid condition so you always have to treat the underlying thyroid condition that is only going to be the proper treatment for these patients so remember it's not going to be familial it's common in male patients it's common in patients of asian descent the serum potassium is going to be much lower than primary hypokalemic periodic paralysis it can be rarely because of potassium channel mutations and the treatment is always treating the underlying thyroid dysfunction so coming to the investigations obviously the patient is going to have a low serum potassium during the attack and you have to rule out other secondary causes of hypokalemia so during the acute attack they obviously you're going to give uh, you're going to supplement the patient with potassium so oral casel around 0.2 to 0.4 millimoles per kilogram given every 30 minutes so how are you going to prevent attacks so low carb low sodium diet so as we discussed earlier a high carb and high sodium diet is going to trigger attack so it's very important the patients have a low carbohydrate and low sodium diet acetazolamide okay so acetazolamide is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor but remember acetazolamide should be avoided in patients who are having type 2 type 2 hypokalemic periodic paralysis it's going to worsen or trigger attacks in type 2 whereas it is a treatment of choice for type 1 hypokalemic periodic paralysis the other drug is dichlorphenamide okay so that's about hypokalemic periodic paralysis now let's go to the other periodic paralysis that is hyperkalemic periodic paralysis so this is because of a sodium channel mutation so always remember hypokalemic calcium channel mutation hyperkalemic is sodium channel mutation so inheritance like for other channel pathies is going to be autosomal dominant the onset is little younger over here it's at around the first decade and the sex distribution is equal males and females are uh, affected equally whereas in hypokalemic males are more commonly involved and here it's going to be an scn4a that is a sodium channel mutation is very very important this is a commonly asked in mcq questions so the triggering factors are going to be different obviously it's going to be different so as we rem as we remember a high carb diet and high sodium diet is going to trigger a hypokalemic attack whereas a period of fasting is going to trigger hyperkalemic periodic paralysis the other triggers are going to be rest following exercise and potassium administration so coming to the clinical features so here also you're going to have a flaccid quadriparesis or quadriplegia but remember the attacks are going to be brief and milder so remember hypokalemic periodic paralysis can last for up to 24 hours it can last for up to 24 hours whereas the attacks are much shorter in hyperkalemic periodic paralysis and they are much milder obviously a proximal muscle weakness because your muscles are going to get involved and the attacks can last for as short as 30 minutes to up to several hours and just like in hypokalemic periodic paralysis your respiratory and bulbar muscles are going to be spared over here and the very very important additional feature that you have to remember is patients over here are going to have myotonia so myotonia is nothing but delayed relaxation after contraction of muscles so there is no myotonia in hypokalemic periodic paralysis but there is myotonia in hyperkalemic periodic paralysis and as we discussed earlier these patients with periodic paralysis are going to develop an inter attack weakness because of a progressive myopathy so this progressive myopathy is much more common in hyperkalemic it's more common in hyperkalemic periodic paralysis compared to hypokalemic periodic paralysis so coming to the investigations so the name is pretty much a misnomer so even though it's mentioned as hyperkalemic periodic paralysis most of the times the serum potassium is going to be normal or it might be slightly elevated but most of the times it's normal and emg are going to have myotonic discharges as we discussed earlier patients are going to have myotonia so the emg can show myotonic discharges so how are you going to treat these patients so an acute attack just a mild period of exercise okay so mild period of exercise or some muscular uh, muscular exertion can abate an attack 
high sugar load so remember low carb diet for hypokalemic periodic paralysis whereas a high carb diet so you can give the patient an orange juice or a candy bar so this can stop an attack other drugs that you can use are thiazide diuretics inhaled beta agonist and for very severe attacks you can try iv calcium gluconate so what are you going to use for prophylaxis the same drugs that you're going to use for hypokalemic periodic paralysis your carbonic anhydrase inhibitors like acetazolamide okay there is also a role of thiazide diuretics for hypokalemic periodic paralysis and for myotonia in patients who are having myotonia mexilatin will be helpful okay so this is about our class on periodic paralysis so thank you